Thank you for visiting Pastor Wyatt TV, the YouTube channel of PastorWyatt.com. You know, at Pastor Wyatt and Pastor Wyatt TV, we like being ahead of the curve. We like talking about things that other people aren't talking about. Uh, we like calling it the way that we see it. And that's exactly what this show is going to be about with a very interesting uh, individual that I think uh, you'll enjoy getting to know and enjoy learning a little bit about and uh, about some of the things he knows about. So sit back, enjoy the show. Thanks for watching Pastor Wyatt TV. And uh, here we go. Profitable Breeders' Cup ever with Pass the Wire. Sign up now for the annual Breeders' Cup seminar. All the angles, winning insights, betting strategy, and more. The best Breeders' Cup seminar on the planet, only from Pass the Wire. With a proven track record of success, nobody does it better. Reserve your spot today at PassTheWire.com. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to what I, I believe is going to be a very interesting episode of Pastor Wyatt TV. Um, we've got one of the most unique and interesting characters that we've ever had on the show. And I mean character in a in a positive way. Um, Larry Roller, who's got a uh, unique and fascinating history in the sport of Kings. Uh, we'll get to all of that in a minute. He's got some un unbelievable stories. I've got some interesting questions for him. Uh, Larry, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Uh, you, you, you're a fascinating guy. Well, thank you very much, and it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, you go back a long way in, in horse racing, and for lack of a better term, I would say you're one of the guys that knows where a lot of the bodies are buried. Uh, so I want, I, want, I want to talk about some of those bodies and some of those stories, but uh, a little bit of your background. How did you get involved in, 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 in horse racing? I know you were born in Queens. You grew up a, a, a street guy, not unlike myself. But how did how, you come to get involved in, in, in horse racing? I give you the real quick version, as we'll be here until Sunday. Um, I started out when I was a young kid racing cars. Uh, I graduated to stock cars, and then I built a couple of roadsters and dragsters that I raced at West Hampton. And uh, the problem, I was like 14, 15, and 16 back then. And uh, the problem I had was every time I blow an engine or a clutch, I had I didn't have enough money to... Um, to uh, um, you know, get the parts. And it put me, I started on a wrong, um, I started crossing the the line way back then just to get money to uh, make these repairs. And one day I was fixing a car in the gas station, horse van pulled in and um, he asked me for a bucket of water. I gave him a bucket of water. I says, where are you going with them horses? He said, to Yonkers Raceway. And I found out at that time that you could race horses for money rather than the blankets and trophies that I was winning uh, at, at Freeport and, and West Hampton. And he invited me out to the farm and um, I instantly fell in love with the horses. But and my passion was racing, going, I just wanted to go fast. And I loved the competition. And uh, ever since I started with roller skates from five years old, I just had to win. I always wanted to win and, and race. So the horses were perfect for me because I loved animals. I loved the horses. I fell in love with them. And the racing was uh, probably more exciting than the, than the car racing. And, um, and you race for money. And that's how I, that's how I started in 19. I started out in 1959 uh, learning and, um, and that's how I that's how I got involved. And through the years, I got involved in in um, in both the divisions of racing, both standard bred, meaning trotters and paces, and and thoroughbreds. Um, and there were periods of time, two times in my life, when I got barred from racing for life, 
Uh, we can get into that later on if you want. But um, and then I raced. Um, I couldn't stay with the standard breads because everybody knew me there. Right. Breads. Uh, I went under a friend of mine, Alan Seawalt. Uh, he was a trainer uh, at Monmouth Park, and, and I remember uh, Alan Seawalt. Yeah, in the winters he went. Well, he started out in harness racing. Right. I helped him get his license when he was a kid. And uh, but harness racing, um, he didn't like it that much, and he switched to thoroughbreds early on. So when I got when I lost my license, uh, I went with him. Um, uh, I bought some horses and I put them under uh, his name and as a trainer and owner, and and that's how. And then he used to sneak me in the barn area. I I I, I was living with him for a long period of time, and. Um, and and that was it. And that's how I that's how I even when I was bought, I was still racing uh, thoroughbreds on un, undercover. Race that we raced at uh, at Hialeah and at Calder, at Gulfstream, Monmouth Park, um, and and a little bit in, in a little bit in New York, Aqueduct and Belmont. And that's how I that's how I started. That's that that uh, now these days uh, twenty years of in between that I left out, but uh, that's where all the stories. Come. Well, well, we'll get into some of that. Um, uh, let, let, let me start with this question, all right? Because you said it, I feel the same way. You hear my crazy dogs barking in the background; they're being a little disruptive, but uh, uh, you love animals, okay? Yeah. yeah. And things go on in horse racing that are not really, in my opinion, conducive to people like us who love animals, okay? Um, there are some bad actors. There are horses that are not really treated well. Um, we've got issues with, you know, you know nowhere, nowhere to put retired horses and horses being, you know, abandoned. You ever find yourself conflicted about loving the game so much and loving the sport so much and those uh, animal issues come into play? Because I do. It it, it frustrates me uh, and causes me some conflict. So I'm curious if it does to you. It, it bothers me. It bothers me a lot. But then you have to realize that you you could the problem that. Um, the, pro the problem that's out there, and, and there's many from what you said, what do you do with the horses after they don't race anymore? From, from, from that problem to the total abuse that uh, some horses get with uh, drugs and, and uh, how, they're, how they're hurt, maimed and killed because the, some trainers don't know the right, you know, uh, in, in, in the top 10 trainers, uh, between them, they have hundreds of horses die of heart attacks. I've been in the business now 65 years. I can't, in my whole 65 years, I never had one horse die of heart attacks. But these are these are these are the abuses. These these heavyweight trainers, and uh, look, they they do what they have to do to create a level playing field for themselves. And once it starts, you you either you either follow the leader and do what they do, meaning um, start importing these drugs from other countries that they have no test for here. Um, and and uh, you using them, the problem is, and I'll give you an example. Uh, um, the elephant tranquilizer. Uh, by the time they found out the right dosage for for elephant tranquilizer, it's a tranquilizer for elephants, but uh, given the, the smaller dose to a horse, it becomes an unbelievable uh, st stimulant and painkiller. And uh, by the time they found out the right dosage, uh, they killed thousands of horses. Uh, and the right dosage is you fill a syringe up with, with the tranquilizer and you shoot everything out, what's left in the hub of the needle. That's the right dosage for a horse. So that's just, a, uh, just, that's just an example of uh, trying to find the right, do right dosage for these drugs that they import from, from other countries. Then you get the guys at the smaller tracks that they buy horses for three thousand, they insure them for ten thousand, then they kill them. Um, it, it's it's it, when you're in the game and you hear of all these horror stories, you realize that you can't fix them. 
you can't be running it to the commission uh, and, and, and ratting on everybody. I never did that in my, my life, my life. Uh, and, and you just, it, it's, it's sad to say, but you have to turn your back to it and just make sure that the horses that you get, um, that they're, they're, uh, they're, they're not abused and, and they're, and they're, um, they're handled with, uh, love and care and, and, uh, and both in, in, in body and, and mind. And, and, and that's all you could do because there's so much abuse. The only good thing now is the animal rights people are on to all of these things and, and uh, they get major, major fines and suspensions. So it's starting to catch up with all of them guys, but it's a, it's terrible because first of all, the horses were not born to be in a 10 by 10 box stall. They were born to run in herds. And now all of a sudden they're in 10 by 10 box stalls. They're out of the stall for maybe, maybe a half hour a day, just to exercise, maybe 40 minutes. So that's, that's the first thing that bothers me. When I had my barn, I made double stalls, so at least they have a lot more room. Uh, and 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 then uh, the thoroughbreds, in in my opinion, um, harness trainers, and I've been in both games for a long, long time. Harness trainers, um, uh, are probably a hundred times more knowledgeable than thoroughbred trainers. Thoroughbred trainers, you know, it's. it's it's uh, you put a bridle on a horse and you, you send him to the starting gate. A, a harness horse probably has maybe 15, 20 pieces of equipment that go on them. And each equipment, if it's not adjusted within a, a half inch of where it should be, that may breaks or anything else. So I won't get into all of that, but, uh, and, and also with, with, uh, with the training, uh, standard bread trainers, they race on the horses race on billboard racetracks. It's like racing on blacktop and uh, a lot more injuries, a lot more uh, breakdowns. So the, the, the tr treating, treating uh, lameness, recognizing lameness, treating lameness um, is uh, uh, the third standard bread trainers have a, a whole lot more experience than that. And they, and then, and they stay at the barn with the vet the, with the, in the thoroughbred industry, you know, the track closes from seven, eight, they go to the track kitchen, the trainers can show up in a suit and tie. Some come, some come with their jeans and they're on a horse watching the horses go. And after that, that vet comes to the barn and then they are gone, they come back a couple hours later to, to the races. And uh, uh, in my experience, uh, they, they don't know, they don't know a hundredth of what uh, it takes to, uh, recognize lameness, uh, maintain lameness in, in both body and mind, you know, you got to keep them happy too. And, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a tough job. And, and that's what I do, but I'm surrounded in both businesses. I was, um, with guys that, um, that abuse horses and, and some of these horses, when they're, when they're, I'll give, I'll give you an example. There was a horse there was a guy called Sam O'Neill. He was a trainer in standard breads. And he had, he invented a feed, a pellet type feed. This was in the, in the middle seventies, I believe. And um, he had a horse stable right next to one of my horses. And um, every day he, he, he tried to get me to buy that horse feed and, uh, but I, I didn't buy it. And he was feeding all his horses the horse feed. There was one horse that wouldn't eat it. So he wound up taking all the hay and straw out of the stall, bedded the horse just on dirt. And uh, after a couple of days, I says, Sam, I says, uh, he says, uh, he'll either, he'll, he'll either he eat it or he'll die. So after maybe four or five days went by, I says, Sam, um, sell me the horse because he's going to die and he says i don't care you want to buy him buy him and i bought him and uh, but these are the things that these are the things that 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 go on they're sickening when when you know what's going on they, they, these trainers putting bags over their horses heads so they can collect insurance money uh and this was uh, uh, and listen whatever i'm saying i'm not just saying it this 
everything I'm saying was in the newspapers already. It's 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 out there. Even even the part where uh, there was a do Dr. Ellsworth up in Monticello, and all of these guys up there, because at all the small tracks, all the trainers are broke. They're they're pennies. That's why it's so easy to fix races at smaller race tracks because nobody has any money. And uh, these kids were buying horses for three thousand dollars from 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 guys that were racing the fairs, and inflating the prices, getting the bill of sale for twenty thousand dollars, and then uh, insuring them uh, for twenty thousand dollars, and then a month later just putting a bag over their head. Or or uh, Doctor Ellsworth had a, a a drug that he gave them that would just stop their heart, and, and the insurance company's vet couldn't couldn't uh, find out. So uh, that's it, them. It's just a couple of examples, but they, they, so, they, so many of them, uh, you know, let, 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 let me get into a couple of things with you because I, I, I think it's relative and it's, it's important. Uh, you know, racing today, like we touched on has, has, has a, a mirror, you know, just so many issues, uh, and it's tough for guys like us and, and everybody that loves the game to, to watch these issues and watch the mismanagement, mishandling of these issues and the lack of, in my opinion, management and regulatory authorities um, having the knowledge, ability, um, and wherewithal to, to handle and address these issues properly. But... You go back a ways, and I go back, uh, you know, not, not quite as far as you, but almost. I remember, and this is something we face today, in the 70s, okay? When I was going to Saratoga every day, spent it every, every, every summer up at Saratoga. My dad was a mutual clerk, so it was like a working vacation for us. We went up to Saratoga, okay? Um, most competitive race meet in the country at that time, okay? probably still today, at least one of them. It comes out that the top riders, big name riders, are holding horses and fixing triples, okay? Nobody would have believed it because everybody had the opinion that, oh, these guys make so much money, they're so competitive, it's Saratoga, it would never happen. It's all in court record. Um, it, 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 there's an abundance of testimony out there, sworn testimony. It was happening on a weekly basis in the triple races. They were paying riders to be out of the money and they were boxing the horses that were going to not be out of the money. Okay. Uh, you were aware of all that and around back then and knew what was going on. I'd like you to touch base a little bit on that. And then more importantly, I want to know. Because people will say, if we ask this question, a lot of the racing people and analysts and journalists, if you throw that out there, do you think that could happen at the major tracks today? They'll tell you, oh, you're nuts. It's crazy. Never happened. Doesn't happen. These guys would never do that. I want your comment on that. Do you think that it can, does, might happen today at some of the bigger tracks? So kind of, kind of walk me through that going back to those Saratoga days and the triples. Um, and what is your call on, on whether or not that does, can possibly, you know, happen at some of the bigger tracks today? All right. Well, first of all, the people that make the rules, uh, the Racing Commission is full of political appointees, uh, ex-police officers and detectives, uh, and they're, they're put into positions of uh, total incompetence. Half of them have never been to a racetrack before. These are the people that make the rules now from the commission all the way down to the state steward, all the way down to the judges at the racetrack. So, and, the, and Congress of the United States gave the racing commissions the right to write their own rules and govern their own body. And so they're like a separate government in themselves and, and uh, total in, incompetent. That's the first thing, starting with the rules they make, starting with the way they they judge races, starting with uh, their inability to, to uh, catch the these uh, 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 the, the the positive tests before they become positive. Um, 
The second thing is uh, what you said about the jockeys. Uh, everything that you're talking about is not only taking place at Saratoga, because Saratoga is just a short meet. It's what, seven, eight weeks, whatever it is. It, it's uh, And the ones at Saratoga come from Belmont and Aqueduct Racetrack. So and back then, it was only a, a four-week meet. Yeah, okay. So if you take... Uh, Aqueduct, Belmont, and Saratoga, it's all the same horses, all the same jockeys. And what you're talking about, fixing races, uh, that was me. That was me and Tony Shuler. And um, I won't get into how it all started unless you want to. But I, I do have, want. I would love to. <laughs> I have a list right here. And the reason I have the list is because I didn't make this list while we were doing it. I made this list after Tony Shuler became a government witness and, and, and ratted on everybody. Uh, and you're right. Every top jockey at Aqueduct, Belmont, and Saratoga is here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 jockeys at, at, from, from Cadero down uh, that that now they were found innocent when they went to trial, but good for them. But I I know what I sent up there. I was sending up for every race. I was sending up uh, anywhere between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars. The first, second, and third choice, first and second choice got five thousand. So let's say Cadero and Baeza was on the first and second choice. They get five thousand apiece. Third and fourth choice or fifth choice. They got twenty five hundred apiece. So every race I would invest, probably, and then I'd give Con Erico, who was the go to guy, the guy that got these guys, uh, I'd give him a thousand, um, a thousand for every guy he got out. So if he got four guys out in a race, uh, um, he got four thousand dollars for every race. Now the reason Con Erico was able to do this is because, and I'm sure you know this, he's he was one of the old timers. He's uh, back in them days, he was his best years were way behind him, but he kept his jockey license, showed up at the jockey's room, and maybe once a week he'd drive a hundred to one shot. Or he'd ride a hundred to one shot. But when I met with him, and I met with him through Manny Ukaza, um, Manny Ukaza, um he broke his knees in an accident at, at, um, at Santa Anita. And the racing commission, Harness Racing Commission, got a hold of me through Charles Slutsky, who owned Monticello Raceway. And um, so Slutsky come to me and he says, the Racing Commission uh, wants, to, wants to know if you would if you would teach Manny Yukaza how to ride and how to drive harness horses and how to train him and everything, because he can't go back to thoroughbred racing because of his knees. And he did. He lived with me for a year. I got him his license. I put him on a couple of horses. He won his first couple of races um that i fixed and uh uh he got a big write-up in the newspaper but through him i got to connor erico and uh me and con erico made it made a deal i i hit him with with uh it, at that time i had to do what i had to do because i owed i i owed uh close eight hundred thousand dollars to a, a couple of killer mob guys uh, and if you want, we can get into that. But uh, there were a couple of bad mob guys. So, um, as opposed to good mob guys, there are a couple of good mob. <laughs> guys. I, I could tell you that story about the good mob guy, a boss, Tommy Lucchese, Tommy Three Finger Brown. He was Tommy, Tommy was before my time, but I could tell you this, and you may agree, you may disagree. I've known my share of wise guys in my life. And, and at the end of the day, most of them at some point, the true colors come out. And I'll just leave it at that. I can only tell you, I can only tell you um, that Tommy Lucchese, my mother ran all his dress factories for him. So that's how my introduction was there. He came to my sister's wedding. I met him, I met him more formally then. But I got in some bad trouble when I was 17 years old. Pretty bad trouble. Um, and um, it was a bad, bad rap. And my mother, ever since I was 10 years old, I was nothing but trouble to her. She was a good woman. 
and she just couldn't control me. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do when I wanted. I was very defiant and nothing mattered. And with my race cars, uh, when I started them at 15, 16, I was robbing gas stations to get money to repair them. And uh, But this one time I went over the line and really got in trouble and then had a detective. Uh, there was a fight in the detective's room with me and Detective Sands from 114 Precinct. And they threw me down in the tombs for three days. They, uh, they, and I was all busted up. They, they, they. Uh, well, he slapped me and I hit him, and then that was it. Then they just crucified me, broke my ribs, jumped up. Because back then, <laughs> back then there was no. You have the right to remain silent. Oh, I know. I, I I've spent a night or two in the tombs. Yeah, so they, I'm, 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 I'm familiar with the accommodations and how it was. <laughs> right. So. Uh, so when I got out, uh, I says, Ma, uh, she she bailed me out. I finally got to court, and uh, I says, Ma, you got to. I can't breathe, and she says, I'm <laughs> I'm taking you where I should have taken you years ago, and she takes me to her boss. And her boss was Tommy Lacase. You know who he is, right? I I've heard of him. Uh, he was the boss of the Lacase crime family, Three Finger Brown. And back then in the 60s and 70s, they controlled everything, all of Manhattan. So she brings me up there and he says to me, he says, um, he asked my mother to leave the room and he says to me, um, uh, I, I want you to know, and I was full of blood. I had dried blood from the Thursday night when they picked me up and my clothes were full of blood. I had dried blood in my ears and my o nose, my eyes, everything. And he says to me, he says, you know, your mother is a good woman and she's my friend and you're breaking a heart with all your nickel and dime bullshit. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You straighten your life out. You go home and think about what I told you. You straighten your life out and I'll help you in every way that I can, including the problem that you have right now. And you'll never have another problem again. And that's what put me on the right track from that point on. From that point on, up until Yonkers Raceway with Tannenbaum, uh, I was one zillion percent straight. So a bad guy, a mob guy that everybody considered bad, turned a kid, me, that was a bad kid, into a real good kid, over the limit good. And uh, so, yeah, there are some good mob guys. So... Um, so now the reason I start doing what I was doing, because I, I developed a terrible, terrible sports betting habit. And uh, when, I, when I started making money, um, when I started making money, it all started when I got bought from Yonkers. Tannenbaum bought me from Yonkers Raceway. Uh, and he sent me to all these small tracks. I was barred because of reciprocity. Yonkers from Roosevelt barred me. I didn't have a thoroughbred trainer's license at the time. even though, And if I did, they would have barred me anyway. Uh, he accused me of stiffing a horse, which I really didn't do. And uh, because I was still straight at that time. But when he barred me from all the New York tracks, um, I was forced to go to Green Mountain and Hinsdale and all these small tracks where you starve to death and you're forced to do to do everything bad. And you stay in the game because you love the game and you love the horses, you love the thrills and the excitement, even if you race for no money. But the 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 re realization hits you when you wake up in the morning, you don't have money to eat, you know. It, so um I I, when I, Lincoln Downs opened, uh, Lincoln Downs was in Boston, and it was the only time in 71 that they had a they had a, a harness meet. They always had thoroughbred racing there, and uh, they had the harness meet. So I applied for stalls there because the purses would double. So I'm sitting in the shed row one day, opening day, and I have the program, and I have two horses in that day, and both horses were morning line favorites. And down the shed row comes uh, three guys, three big guys, three, over six feet tall, must weigh 300 pounds. And uh, they walk up to me and they said, you Larry Roller? And I says, yeah. And they said, uh, um, my name's Tony Schuler. I'm with, uh, we control all the racetracks in Boston here. I'm with the Winter Hill Gang and Whitey Bulger. And we, we, we control everything. And if you're interested in making any money, um, 
uh, we, we can we can do some business. So I asked him, I said, what do you have in mind? And he says, well, you have two morning line favorites. He says, uh, I'll give you 200 a horse. Tell me what stall they're in, and I'll have my vet take care of them, and, and you won't have to worry. You, you know, you'll be up the track. And I said to him, I said, um, listen, now, now you have to remember, I grew up around these guys. That's how I grew up in, in the neighborhoods I grew up in. They were all, it was all mob infested, just like every other Italian neighborhood. So I just didn't want to go that route. I just didn't follow the leader. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. I didn't want to take orders from anybody or do, you know. So I, I kind of stayed by myself all the time. So um, so I said, listen. So, so he, in other words, he didn't intimidate me. You know, I knew what he was. I knew what he was going to do, and it didn't intimidate me. So I said, um, so when, when he says, you know, we control everything around here, I, I said, well, good for you, you know. And, right. And he, so, well, if you're interested in making any money, I'll give you 200 a horse. You got two morning line favorites. Just tell me the stall number. I'll have my vet take it. And I told him, I says, listen, I said, um, I know what you're doing. I want 500 a horse. I want 500 a horse cash right now. Tell your vet to stay home. So he he looks at me. He starts laughing. He says, he says, uh, you know who the fuck you're talking to? And I says, it really don't make a difference. I says, look, if you want a deal, we'll deal. I says, but I ain't doing nothing for two hundred dollars, and there ain't no vet touching my horse. So he counted out the, the five hundred thousand uh, dollars he gave me, and he says, "I sure hope you know what you're doing, because I'll be back in the morning." And uh, and I said, "Good, uh, bring coffee, no sugar, and a bagel with cheese." And um, next morning he showed up with the coffee and the bagel, and uh, he made a lot of money, and he was very happy. And uh, through that's what start that's what started this whole race fixing thing, and uh, after about two or three weeks, maybe after about a week, he was making a lot of money, just with me. And he says to me, he says, "Can you get anybody else, any other drivers?" So within a week, I got seven, eight other guys because everybody was starving up there. All at all the small tracks at the same time. I mean, right now, if you go to Finger Lakes, half the jockeys are living in tack rooms. So, right. so uh, we made a lot of money. And one day, he he, uh, after we we were we were we were doing well. So one day, he he's as he's walking away, he says, "By the way," he says, "You want any action? I got some. Uh, I got a big edge on a, on hoops tonight." At that time, I didn't even know what hoops were, but I found out later he was fixing college basketball games. So right. I said, now I'm making a lot of money with the guy and uh, we become a little friendly. And I says, yeah, whatever you do, do, do for me. Next morning he comes back, he hands me $3,000. And uh, he says, uh, I bet for you on this case. He says, I got two tonight. You want, I said, do whatever you do for you, do for me. And I started making more money betting with him, with the games that he was, I'm, I assume he was fixing them. Uh, I didn't ask any questions. I didn't care. I mean, I just took the money. And um, it started, it's been, now I, I became like, uh, it started, the addiction started. And when the meet ended, I, I was fully addicted because after about a week, and I must have made 20,000 just saying, yeah, do what you do for, um, whatever you do for you, do for me. I, um, I started to ask him, you got a, you got anything tonight? You got anything today, tonight, you know? And I started getting addicted. And I was waiting for him to show up more than he was waiting for me to show up. So uh, that's how the addiction started. And to fast forward within, uh, within a year, um, with the horses fixing the races and everything, by 1972, I made over a million dollars fixing races and lost a million dollars betting on sports. So what happened one day, just to fill you in was for the reason why I start fixing these races. So what happened one day, it was in 1972, I had all my money, all my money that I made fixing races, let's just call it a million dollars. Uh, I lost betting sports. 
Now, I lost to two, two different guys. One was an old uh, Maya Lansky book, Jewish guy. He was in his seven, late 70s. He was up in Monticello, retired, but he was taking action. And the other guy was a guy uh, from New Jersey that a friend of mine hooked me up with uh, called uh, Robert. Uh, his nickname was Cabert. Everybody knew him, Cabert. He's a, a fucking madman. Uh, I found out later that he was really, really big. Killed 17 guys. He'd shoot you right between the eyes for, for no reason. Just a nut, a whack job. And um, so when I ran out of money, I had excellent credit because every Tuesday was pay or collect. And I never collected. I always paid. And it was it was during the uh, during the football season at that time. And uh, and I'm sure you know that out of the 15, 16 season games, statistically, the player wins maybe three times. You, you got got no shot with football and nobody knows why. Maybe it's the shape of the ball. Nobody knows why. But anyway. I was pretty well addicted, and, it, and and because of my credit, it started off with uh, 5,000 5, a game, and then it went up to 10, and then there was really no limit, but um, I was betting 10,000 10, a game or 20,000 a game uh, with each each of them, with, with Kubert and with uh, Barney. And uh, I bet all 10, 11 games, whatever was playing that Sunday, and... Uh, and I, I, I went broke. Now, when I went broke, they didn't know I was broke. They only knew that I was in horse racing. I was in big action. I had money. I paid every week, whatever it was, 40, 50,000, whatever it was, I paid each of them. And uh, so I went to them one day and I said, listen, I, I was penniless. They didn't know this, but I was addicted. And I, I says, oh, my God, I paid them off on, on, on that Tuesday and I had no more money left. And um, I was starting to shake because I, I'm like, I got to get even. I get because the chase is what gets you. You keep chasing and chasing and chasing, and that's what kills you. Vicious cycle. Vicious cycle. Yeah, I, I says, look, I, I'm I'm going to Florida for a couple of weeks. I'm going to buy some property down there, so you won't see me for two or three weeks. Knowing they were going to say, no problem, just call up. I'll give you the line, and uh, yeah. And then I says, well. Uh, if I lose, I ain't going to be here to pay you. Don't worry about it. And I knew they were going to say that. All right. So uh, I went to Florida. Three weeks later, I was stuck a little over 700000 to both, to, to between the two of them. About three eighty dollars a piece, I think, something like that. So I couldn't go anymore because every week I said, okay, I found a problem. We're going to close in two weeks. And so now it was over and I couldn't stall no more. And it was getting serious. So um, I had to make a decision. I run away, or kill myself, or go back. I went back. So one of uh, Cabert's guys picks me up at the airport. I landed at Newark. He picked me up. He says, you want to go home and get, because uh, he's waiting for you. And I says, I have no money. And he says, well, you got a problem. So he calls him up. He says, bring him down here the next morning. I go down there the next morning. And... Uh, he has a little cafe down in um, Atlantic Highlands. It's a big boat basin, whatever they call it, with a big catering hall. And um, we walk in. He's sitting in the back like a typical mob movie scene, a little table, smoking a cigar, drinking Demi-Tac uh, coffee. And, and uh, so we walk in. Uh, they walk out the back, and they walk down to the dock. And they walk out and they put me in a on a boat, one of these 30, 40 foot things, and they go out and they bring me downstairs. And about a half hour later, they bring me out in the ocean and they bring me upstairs. They put me in a bucket, uh, like a half a 55 gallon drum. And they says, get in there. And they poured a couple of bags of cement in, pump some water in there. And then Cabert comes and he says, uh, Sammy, we'll let you go too far. Um, and that's on him. You went too far, and that's on you. Now, you tell me why I shouldn't let this cement harden and throw you the fuck overboard. And I said, because I could pay. And uh, he looked he looked at Sammy, and 
He says he says he could pay. He says, well, we, we got almost a million dollars of his money. You know, he's in big action. Maybe he could pay. He said, all right, you could pay. He says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You you owe me 380 I think it was. Uh, I'm going to make this a Shylock loan. Two points. Every week you come here, you see him 7,200 every week. You miss one week, and you'll be right back here with no turning back. And I made the same deal with Barney up up in New York. With Barney, it was a little easy. He was an older guy, uh, my, uh, my girl Friday, a good girl, Gina. She lived in the same complex as him. And um, uh, so and making any kind of deal with him was, was easy because she used to make him breakfast in the morning. They, they became good friends. So I wasn't wor ever worried about Barney. He just was a nice old guy. You really had, you know, in, in reality, you really had no gripe with, 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 with the way Kebert handled it he, he, either. I mean, he, 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 you know, I mean, he... He did what well, you're, you're you know. right. He, he handled it the way a mob guy's supposed to handle it, right? right. Yeah, he, I got I have no gripe. That was my right. fault. I mean, I'm wrong, I'm wrong, right? You know, uh, it, it's the same thing like later on, years I'll, ju I'll jump ahead, uh, three, four years when when uh, Gotti sent for me. Uh, for, for I met Gotti when I was a kid when we were robbing stuff. He was he knew a couple of fences and we were doing stuff when I was 16, 17. He got rid of uh, I dropped three trail loads of uh, 1100, three trail loads of Cuddy Sock whiskey. There were 1100 cases in each truck. And he he found a guy who owned catering halls that that border all we whacked up the money. So I knew John from when we were kids <laughs> and he sent for me one day. He was up by Regal Park right past Corona. and. Uh, he says, I heard you're doing something with uh, my pal because Cabert was Gotti's button guy. And That's, I, I, I know that. Yeah. Okay. I, I know who Bobby was. So. Oh, you do? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So, so, uh, uh, I, so, so the reason I brought that up was because I couldn't ask John, look, being that you're, you, you you know Bobby, could you speak up for me and tell him to take it easy? You can't do that because I was wrong. You can't go because Bobby had all the right in the world to say to John, uh, you, 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 you're on his side, we'll pay the money. You know, so I couldn't. I just had to pay because I was wrong. So when you're wrong, you're wrong. You got to pay. And Cabert was right. I got uh, so I got I got to tell you a funny story. I got to tell you for that, that I think you'll love. OK, Um I, I got to interrupt to tell you this because the timing is, is is just perfect and it parallels so much about your life parallels a little a little, a little bit about mine. We love horses, we love fast cars. I never raced them, but I like to drive them. Uh, and similar, something very very similar happened to me. Okay, and you'll probably be able to figure out who it is, but I'm not going to name them just that out of respect, but. I was going to the track every day, okay? And all I was doing was gambling. I was a- What, what track? Gambling. Um, Aqueduct in Belmont, okay? My dad was a mutual clerk and I was, this was how to be the mid eighties, late eighties, late okay? Um, and I was going to the track every day and a certain guy was becoming and had just become a very well-known powerful mobster and everybody knew who he was. And he used to like to go to the racetrack and go to Belmont. Right. And I, for a kid my age, was betting a lot of money. I was betting, you know, two hundred dollar doubles, five hundred dollar exactness, thousand to win, betting like an animal. But all the money I had in the world was in my pocket. OK, um, I was a gambler. So I could have five thousand today, broke tomorrow, looking to borrow a hundred to make a bet. OK, so one day this guy who I didn't know just at a you know, say hello to, like not hello to out of familiarity out of people you see at the track, calls me over and says, come, kid, come here. So, of course, I know who he is and I'm very respectful. I'm like, yeah, he goes, I got to ask you, you bet a lot of money. What, what, what is it that you do? And I'm like, this is it. This is all I do. He goes, you just bet horses? I says, yeah. he goes, it's kind of future. This is just ridiculous. You can't do that. I said, I win. I hold my own. I do that. He goes, I don't know. He goes, listen. He goes, I want you to go with my friend after the races. He's going to give you a way to make some money. I'm like, okay. So 
I tell my friend that I'm at the racetrack with every day. I'm like, wow, this guy wants me to go with his friend. But I don't know what, what, he, what he could possibly want. He goes, you got to go. He goes, he asked you, you got to go. You got to go. I'm like, okay, I go. After the races, takes me, this was at Aqueduct, a couple of blocks to a house in Howard Beach, pull my car into the driveway. He opens up the fucking driveway and there's boxes and boxes of polo, Ralph Lauren, the polo shirts with the emblems on them, okay? And he goes, fill them in your car, fill them in your car, fill them in your car. I put as many in there as I could. He goes, I got to get $10 a shirt. They're authentic. Whatever you get for them, you get for them. He goes, I get $10 a shirt. Let me know when, when, when they're all gone. We load you up again. I go back to my neighborhood in Sheepshead Bay. I'm selling shirts. I go to the park where I used to hang out. Everybody's buying shirts. I had every color. Before you knew it, I lived in an apartment building with an intercom. Okay, I grew up poor. Okay, it was like what you would call a tenement. Okay, but it had an intercom where it had an and, and you go, who's there? And you had to buzz them into the building. After a while, my parents were getting mad at me. People were ringing the bell. And, who's there? We're looking for the guy with the shirts. Okay, I sold so many shirts that summer. I went out and I bought a white Eldorado Baritz loaded with money, making money all summer, shirt, 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 shirt. So now I buy the car at a, at a, at a money, okay? Wait for more shirts. I get more shirts. I sell them. I'm going to give the guy the money. I'm at the track, Belmont Park, waiting, 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 waiting. I remember the horse's name. You don't forget things like this. There's a horse running named Infinite. Okay, first time starter, Angel Penna horse um, for Ogden Phipps. Mile and a quarter on the turf, first time out. Angel Penna was one of the only guys that does that, all right? I go to the window and I take all the shirt money. It was like $4,000. I bet all the money to win. Boom. Race goes off. The guy's not there yet, right? Race goes off. And you know how gamblers do things. We do things impulsively, right? Sure enough, the horse laying third, 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 third. Angel Cordero on the horse swings to the outside, makes a move, wins going away. Bang. Okay? Horse wins. As he wins, here comes the entourage up the escalator, heads right for the bar on the second floor at Belmont. So I go over to them. And I say to the guy, I say, you guys are going to think I'm crazy. They're like, what, what, what? I'm like, I took all the shirt money and I bet it on a horse. And Larry, it's funny how things go, okay? All the faces got serious and not friendly serious. And I says, see, look at you guys. Right away, you want to make it, make it thing. The horse won. All right. He's three to one. We're all partners. We all just doubled our money. And right away, you want to get mad at me because I bet the shirt money on a horse. And now, oh, we love this kid. He's crazy. We love you. We love you. We love you. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have your attention? There is a steward's inquiry involving infinite at the top of the stretch. Now the faces got serious again. They disqualified a horse. I remember he bothered a horse named Emily's Hot Tub, a P.G. Johnson horse that John Luke Samik, Samin rode. When he went to move out, Angel moved out. Boom, he gave him a little bump. Today he might not have come down. You never know. They disqualified the horse and got a nickel. Next thing I know, come with us. I'm in the back of a car with these guys. They drive me to Ozone Park, Howard Beach, near Kennedy Airport. And the guy sitting in the back looks at me and he goes, I want to ask you a question. I says, what? He goes, what's the only reason that I'm not going to leave you here? I was scared. I didn't know. Okay, I didn't know what to say. So I was honest. I said, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't, I, I, I don't know. He goes, there's one reason. He goes, when that horse won, he goes, nine out of 10 guys would have kept quiet, cashed the ticket, gave me my money, not said a word. But you didn't do that. 
You came and you said we were partners and you were going to share the winnings. He goes, and that's why I'm not leaving you here. And that's why you made a friend. He goes, but you're also going to learn a lesson. You're going to pay me back every dime. You're going to pay me back interest. And the end of the story is I made a very good friend. I loved the man. He always looked out for me till he passed. But I think I must have paid him about 50000 for the, for the, for the three 4000 I bet, because I sold church for about another three years and didn't make a nickel for myself. But um, that's what that, 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 that's what happened. So that's that's a similar story to some of the kind of stuff that that you experienced, um, not on your level, obviously. Uh, but I definitely learned a lesson about not betting other people's money, which is something that I haven't done since that day that they took infinite down. I got it. I got it. Um, <clears throat> me too. So, I, if you, if you add it up, uh, I had to come up with 7,200 VIG for uh, the, the uh, close to 400,000. It was 380, I think. Uh, at two points, I had to come up with seventy two hundred a week for both of them. Three hundred, I think it was. Uh, I think it was thirty eight hundred a week that I had to give uh, convert. Uh, it was seven two hundred between both of them, and after um, after I think four years, when I had a when I finally when something happened, I I wind up paying three times more than what the original loan, you know, original thing was. Yeah, I mean, the two points will get you every week, two points. Yeah, it kills you. 380, kills you. still owe the balance. And I never once, in all the major scores I made, I never once made 400,000 in one lump sum that I can go and say here. Right. Uh, and I never went to him and said, listen, I have 150,000, let's take it off to 400, I owe you. And uh, I'll just pay two points on the other 200. I never went to him. Maybe he would have did it. Maybe he wouldn't. I just didn't want to have too much to do with him because he was a fucking mad hatter. He was a madman. And you, you, if you know him, you know what I'm saying. He was a bad, 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 bad guy. Crazy, nuts. Uh, but I, I could relate to, to, to your story. And, and, uh, and you're right. The two points, two points get you. And two points is a <laughs> A good loan back then. Right, exactly. Right, three points was probably yeah. the going rate. Three, four, three points. You, you know, rate. right. Two was a favor. Was you know, two was a right. Five or six points. Yeah. Right, two was a favor. Really, you know what I mean? Um, there were guys lending money that were getting it at two points. So well, yeah, most of the guys got it at one point yeah. if they were if they were hooked up with the with the crew. Uh, right. If they, if they weren't. They were getting it for two points, and then you had to pay three or four or five or right. six. Right, right. Now, let me let, let, let me ask you this. The people that are in racing today, okay, um, when you throw at them, you know, I saw a ride that looked very questionable. You know what I mean? Guy, too far back, too much to do. He's too good a rider to go that far back and that wide and think he could win. The race is over, then he comes flying for second. Look like he didn't, oh, you're crazy, conspiracy theory. These guys would never do that. They make too much money. What do you say to that today? Are these people are just naive or are, are, are we dinosaurs living in the past? Well, like, like I said before, I have, I have uh, 10, 15 names from, from New York, Saratoga, Belmont, um, uh, New Jersey, Atlantic City, Garden State. So back then they did it, and I'm sure, but nobody did it at the level I did it at and, and, and putting out the kind of money. Don't forget, I put out for every, I didn't just go up to a guy and say, you think you could win and try to, you know, what do you think about this? Right. Or everything. I completely eliminated gambling from gambling. Right. There was no gamble involved in when I made a bet. Every once in a while. Well, somebody... one guy, some one guy, I, I'm familiar with the case. One guy did somehow wind up finishing in the money who wasn't supposed to. I want to say it was no. Mark Castaneda, maybe. I forget who it was, but 
One guy messed up. Through the years, and this is the problem I have with with, with uh, Tony Shuler, and it started at Lincoln Downs. At Lincoln Downs, the last race at Lincoln Downs, now we already made 30,000, 40,000 each betting, uh, not counting the sports betting, betting just to, to fix races. And I told him, I says, every once in a while, somebody's going to run over the money. It, it's inevitable. Right. It has to happen. Some you, You're out there. I know because I drove. Right. You find yourself in a position where maybe one or two horses made a break or they get used up early and they're just fading. There's nothing you can do. You make it up the next time. But what Tony did in the last race, guy ran over the money. And um, and uh, he waited for me. It was the last race at Lincoln Downs. He waited for him. I was shipping. I was loading my horses, shipping out. I was going up to Freehold. And um, I got a call about a week later from one of the uh, drivers that Tony waited for this kid and beat the shit out of him bad. He was in the hospital. Uh, I had to send 5000 because he was going to report him. And I says, the guy's going to get himself in trouble. I says, so, so I, I paid all his doctor bills. I sent him up 5000 He forgot about it. Uh, but these these things happen uh, that you run over the money. And when Tony came up to Monticello after Lincoln Downs, and when I got to Monticello, um, and and he was he was the middleman for me with Conor Rico, to do all the New York, Belmont, and Saratoga, Atlantic City, and Garden State, um, I told him, one of these guys run over the money. D don't leave him alone. We'll make it up the next time. Right. And he took five thousand of my fucking money. I'll break his fucking. You, you're gonna ruin the whole thing. You, you, they're gonna go to the cop. You get you just forget about it. We'll make it up. The next time he has a favorite in, he's gonna do what he has to do for nothing. So just. And and but every once in a while he he'd rough these guys up. I remember there was a jockey. I think his name was uh, Jose uh, Amy Amy. Uh, I think it was Amy. Uh, I forgot. He well, Jose the, Amy's the one that really took the fall for all of that. So yeah. I I told him he he says ah oh, this fuck out. we can't get him a, leave him alone forget about it. I told I told Conor Rico go to the guy you know all these guys they were they were all kids they, he, he he knew he knew them all because he was the senior guy i says you know who you could trust you know who the good guys are the bad guys the guys that are a little iffy deal with the guys you know you could trust but shula they went to amy a couple of times he wouldn't take the money two there were two other guys too leave them alone but don't bother with them they kept pushing and pushing and pushing, and uh, they they wind up ca causing big scenes. That and the only and the reason funny thing is, Amy is the guy that wound up getting. He's the one guy that got convicted and suspended. Um, the other guy got, got dead too. The other Mike Hole. Yeah. So, so Mike Hole, I, I don't know how much we can or can't talk about Mike Hole, but Mike Hole, I don't know what happened. I never believed he committed suicide. No, I, I, I have I have no comment. All I know is that I told I told Shula uh they don't want to take the money, leave them alone. Just leave them alone. My and, friend uh, Ray had breakfast with him the morning they found him in Liz's kitchen on the backside of Belmont Park. <clears throat> Happy, jovial, not a care in the world, did not seem like a guy that was what on talking way. about. Mike Hole. Oh, okay. Yeah, did not seem like a guy that was. That's why nobody believes he killed himself. You know. Right. I I I, I never thought so. I don't know, but I, I and I don't know the particulars of his involvement in that whole thing. But I I just never believed it. Um. Do you think? And and I mean, history's taught us that where there's money there's corruption and people will do things that you don't expect. Um, do you think that race fixing, and you know what always fascinated me when you talk about race fixing, people automatically who don't know the game think, oh, there's a preconceived known winner. We know who's gonna actually win. And that's not actually how it works. We really know who's not gonna win, which leaves the horses that might win. And we don't even know which one of those is actually going to win. Um, and most people don't understand that. They think, oh, race fixing means that these guys know who the winner is. Very good. 
very good. That's why they have uh, uh, they they have. Um, well, it, you you didn't even. I, I'll give you two examples. One example is what you just said. Uh, if you if you make say. Uh, um, um, Say you want to box four horses in the Super. The last race every every night uh, at Monticello and maybe Yonkers too uh, was a, a super factor. So you had to you had to box four horses, four horses. You got four horses out. You box four horses. That's twenty four uh, twenty four combinations. Okay, you don't care who wins. You don't care who. You don't try to pick a winner. You just you know who ain't gonna win, and you take the rest of the field and you box them. Now I'll give you another example. Um, that's what I did. That that's what I did for for, for right. years. There was a time in 1975 when Fat Tony and and um, Con Fat Tony Con Tony was supposed to call me every day, at twelve o'clock tell me the ins and outs, what races and everything else. He would bet at the racetrack and I would send my runners to OTB offices. So then he started calling uh, every other day, then every third day, then then once a week. And and uh, then there was a problem. I won't get into that whole thing, uh, how how we eventually found him. I, with the help of Frank Collada and, and uh, uh, um, uh, um, Spilatro, um, th 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 if you don't know, you know who them guys are, right? Tony yeah. Spilato and Frank Lotta, uh th they wind up uh, doing me a favor. In fact, that, that favor that they did for me, uh, Frank Collada put it in his book. Um, one of his books, he called me up and he says to me, remember, remember that thing we did in 74? He says, I'm writing another book. Do you mind if I put that chapter in? I said, I don't give a fuck. Well, what do I care? So he put it in, and the reason I wrote my book was because a couple of years later, he I saw him at a wedding in Vegas, and uh, he says, "You know, of all the chapters, I get question, I get asked more about that chapter with you. You should write your own book, and that's what caused me to to write to write my my book, and um, um, which uh, it immediately got picked up by Sony Pictures and everything to make a." A, a movie and TV series, but you don't want to go into all of that stuff. Uh, well, I'll put a link to all of that in the, in, the, in the description for you. So if anybody wants to buy Larry's book, which I recommend you buy, um, they'll be able to find it. So I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll put all that in there for you. Don't worry about all right. Now, now, what was I saying before I went off on one of my stupid rants? You were talking about uh, Nikki and, and, and Frank. Okay, doing so now... Favor. So well, Tony, if I can favor, but but what I really want to know. Well, let me let me just finish today. This. What's happening? Do you think today? But we'll get to that. Go ahead, finish. Okay, so now we already discussed how how I made money fixing races. Just get the guys out, and the re remaining horses just box them because once the favorites are out, ninety percent of the money is still in the pool, and that's what you're going to get by whoever else wins so that's how you make and all i want to do is invest maybe twenty thousand fixing the race uh and, and bet another twenty thirty thousand and just double my money and if you do it right. two three times a day you wind up winning a hundred thousand a day and sometimes you get very a little, little risk right yeah yeah and it's very little so, risk. so now when i get in a little bit of trouble when tony shula's not calling no more and i still got to make this sixteen thousand a week payment uh, I'm getting myself in a little bit of trouble. And what happens is uh, a friend of mine calls me up, the maitre d' at the Concord Hotel. And he says to me, he says, Larry, uh, I need a favor. A couple of friends of mine from the old neighborhood, they're up here. They come to see Natalie Cole. This was in 74, I think. Natalie Cole was making a, a debut, her first on the road tour or whatever. And uh, she's opening up at the at the Raleigh Hotel, and uh, they came up and they couldn't get no rooms, they couldn't get seats in the theater, they they couldn't get nothing. Now at the time, uh, I had horses with Bobby Parker who owned the Concord Hotel. I had horses with Manny Halbert who owned the Raleigh Hotel. 
I had horses with Slotsky, who owned, who owned Monticello Raceway, and the Neverly Hotel and Grossage. I had horses with all the hotel owners. So I made a call, and I got them rooms, and I got them front table for Natalie Cole. Who were they? Nikki Bonds, Jazz, uh, bon uh, Robbie, and uh, Leon Batts. The, uh, you know who they are, the whole crew, the whole council from uh, Hong Kong. I know who they are. Drug right. dealers. So uh, uh, I won't go into the whole thing, but um, uh, I, meet, I meet them uh, after I got them everything. They wanted to give me some money. I wouldn't take it. Um, I told them um, I'm have, I have a horse race. In the front. They want to take me out to dinner. I says, I can't go. I have a horse race. And, and uh, that's when they found out that I was a trainer driver at Monticello. And uh, they said, well, we'll have dinner there, which they did. Halfway uh, when the dinner was over, I says, I got to go into the paddock. I have a horse in the last race. And they says, what is it? We'll bet. I'll bet for you. I says, no, you can't bet. There's no handle here. Two handles, 200,000 for the whole night. I, we, you know, we fixed the race. Each of us uh, get, uh, get a ticket and then uh, we win a thousand, two thousand each. And, and that's what we do every night. So uh, he says, I want to talk to you after the race. I'll meet you at the Concord. So that's what we do. At the Concord, he says to me, he says, listen, I can get down 5,000 a position. And I says, uh, <laughs> I says, I, I, I says, listen, no, no disrespect. There ain't a bookmaker in the world going to take a bet on, on a trotting track, much less 5,000 5, right. at track odds. I says, right. it's impossible. He says, Larry. We bet, me and my crew, we bet close to $2 million a week on sports every week with Fat Tony Salerno from the uh, Gigani, you know, Genovese wow. group. And his, his uh, uh, um, Nicky Barnes's garage, I think it was on 145th Street. And I, I'm almost positive. In fact, that where the garage used to be, it's Al Sharpton's building now. But Salerno... Uh, Fat Tony had had his office right down the road from there, and they bet a million, two million every week with uh, betting sports, and they they don't ever win. So I, I says I don't believe he's going to give you that action. So he they went home and he called me back. He says we got five thousand position track odds. Wow. So I says okay. So now the formula that I used all them years don't work no more. Cause now I just need, I need a winner. I right. can't get seven, eight guys in a race dead. I can't. So now I do it myself. So what I did was uh, <laughs> I had about 30 horses at the time. Up in Monticello. Uh, I knew that the, 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 tra the tattoo guy, the guy that comes around, checks the equipment and everything else. They check the tattoo. So I, I knew him because I've been racing up there for, for five, six, seven years already, and I knew him good. So I went to him, and I said, listen, I says, if I give you $1,000, uh, when you come to see my horse, if the tattoo isn't right, will you just pass him by? And he says, for $1,000? I says, yeah. I says, I may do this once or twice a night, but I'm going to do it every every race, every time, every every night. So I says, you got a shot to make yourself four, five, six thousand a week. He says, absolutely, I'll do it. So all I had to do then was, uh, 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 I'll, I'll use claiming. I never put them in claimers. I had condition races, you know, uh, non-winners of 1,500 or whatever. But I'll use claiming races so that your audience can understand it. Let's say I have a horse and a $3,000 claimer. And I have a horse that looks pretty much like him. That's a $20,000 claimer. I would just bring the $20,000 claimer in, 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 in place of the, the cheap one. I'll put the good one. When the tattoo guy comes, he just passes him right by. So now I'm racing a $20,000 claimer in a $3,000 race, uh, in claiming race. So I can't lose. Now, naturally, I never put them in claimers. It was always condition races, but the, right. that... It's just a, a layman's example so the audience would understand. So I have a much better horse. Uh, it would be like Mike Tyson fight, fighting a flyweight, you know. Right, yeah, right. It's, it's like the, the easiest way to, to cheat legally in, 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 in right. horse racing, in my opinion, is take a horse that's worth 75000 first time out and run him for maiden 20. Nobody knows. They jog and race is over. So, and then and then what I did was uh, I would take uh, 
I, that horse is in the race. I would give uh, maybe four or five hundred to Charlie, one of my runners, and say here. And they all knew who my runners were. And he'd go to the window and bet another horse in the race, maybe the second choice or third choice. And because there was no handle, if he bet 200 on a horse, the whole race drive, Larry Roller's betting on a four horse, you know, and they all make that horse the favorite. My horse goes up in odds. I'm getting track odds from Fat Tony. And, and the 5,000 a position, win, place, and show, we do the same thing in the, in the place pool and the show pool. So we get we, we, what we should have got to win. We were getting for place and show and the win price kept, you know, w was higher and he paid every week. He paid. Unfortunately, it only lasted uh, four or five months and then they all got pinched. That, that's when they all went away for, 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 for life. Uh, in fact, on my show, the only one that's still alive, well, there's two of them still alive, Jazz and uh, uh, Leon. I had Leon on my show to tell that story, how he did it and what he, what he did. Uh, he was on one of my podcasts. I think it was podcast number six. And it was funny because the night before, he got mugged. He got mugged in Newark. And he come to, <laughs> he'd come to my show with a hat on, and he had a bunch of stitches down his back. He had a big lump on his head. But he did the show. Anybody could get mugged in Newark. Huh? Anybody could get mugged in Newark. It's 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 bad now. I didn't ask him what he was doing there, but uh, he, he but he did the show and he told that story how it how it happened. And uh, in fact, he was the youngest one. He when they all went to jail, he was only twenty years old at the time. And and I remember I says to Lee, to 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 Nikki, I says um, he says you'll be dealing with Leon, and and I says. Who he's a kid, I you know I don't. And he says that kid who walked through hell with dynamite in his pockets. Don't you worry about him. And uh, I found out that he was um, he did a lot of work for him at a young age. And when they all went to trial, they couldn't get him for none of narcotic stuff. They got him for for other stuff. But uh, he got he got ten ten to life, and he got out in about fifteen, I think. And uh, but I was able to locate him and find him. Everybody else was, uh, uh, jazz was half senile. I couldn't get him. But anyway, I try to, everything I say, I try to justify. You know, I try to make it credible because right. some of these stories are not, are, are not believable. Well, I wouldn't have had John if I didn't already know that you were credible. So I, I, I know who you are and know that you, you're really not a BSer. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's why I had John. But, what I what I gotta get out of you, what I gotta get today, horse racing today. All right, I'm not talking about drugs. Okay, we know there are issues with drugs. Talking about riders, trainers screwing around, quote, fixing races, however they do it. Do you believe that today, and I'm talking on the higher levels at the bigger tracks, you know, California, New York, Kentucky. Do you believe there were shenanigans going on even today? Or do you think that, that that part of the game has pretty much gone by the wayside? You got to realize now we can bet with our phones. I can bet five, ten thousand dollars on my phone in two seconds with a minute to post time. Jockeys have phones in the jockey's room. They're not barred. They're on the phone. They're, they're Facebook posting and, and tweeting in the, in the jockey's room. So what do you think about today, the sport today, as far as that aspect of it? I haven't been to the racetrack in, in a long, long time, I, but I hear a lot of things. Uh, and so my answer is yes, uh, it's, still, it's still going on. Not near the level that I was doing it, but yes, it's still going on. In fact, on one of my podcasts, I, have, I got a response from a guy, and he keeps coming back and forth. He was an ex-jockey. And now he's a judge. So he's limited in what he can tell me. But he tells me something off the record, a couple of things. And I have I printed it out that right now in it it uh, it the uh, tracks in California, a lot of that is going on. Um and so so even though I, I don't know firsthand, um uh, I would say uh yes, it's it's going on. It it, it almost has to go on. It 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 uh it, wherever there's money, there's, uh, 
I mean, you got, look, you go in the paddock, all the jockeys, them guys been riding together now for 15, 20 years all together. So you're in the jockey's room and, and uh, you right next, like when I was driving, I was sitting right in my locker was next to John Campbell, Billy O'Donnell, and you just wind up talking. And I'm sure that these jockeys, then this horse is no good, this horse. Is no, and like you said, you just take your phone, you make a $5,000 bet. And, uh, and, and I don't believe it's, it's being fixed by like what I used to do, give them 5,000 to be out of it. It's just right. amongst themselves, I, I believe. And I'm sure that there's one or two uh, guys, whether it be mob guys or not, that know a couple of jockeys really well. And they just give them, yeah, this horse will be real good today or something like that. You know, or this horse, right. is, he's the favorite, but he, he's not good at all. And it's easy for them guys to stiff a horse because all they have to do, because the trainers and the media and everybody puts them jockeys on pedestals. So it's easy for the jockey to come back and say, uh, geez, he just wasn't good today. He was, you know, laboring and the trainer. Okay. Now the trainer runs back, calls the vet, they scope him and they do everything. They find nothing right. wrong. It was just a jockey just giving them a bullshit story. But they believe everything that that they say, so it's so easy for them to. There's to, a million a, mil, a million ways to, to 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 lose a race for a rider. You could just you know yeah. put yourself on the inside, you know, surrounded by horses, and just never get out. Um, you could drop so far back where you just give yourself too too much to do, go too wide. I mean, there, there, there's a hundred one a thousand ways to lose a race. Even the well, handle is in, in the gate. It, right. it goes from the gate you know you, you you get you get friendly with all of these guys and you just just hang on when this when the gate springs hang on or just hang on there, there, there was a rumor in saratoga and again i don't know how true it is you know or was but there was a rumor three or four years ago in saratoga that there was a big investigation into guys on the gate crew making bets and that year coincidentally now whether the coincidence started the rumor or vice versa. I don't know, Larry, but there were a lot of horses that seemed to be not getting good starts and the, you know, the handlers seemed to have a hold of them. Um, horse comes out of the gate with his head cocked. You, you know what I mean? Right. And then, and he, 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 you, you know, like over the bridle. and that investigation got, or the rumors of it got quieted down very, very quickly. Um, yeah. And that always raises a red flag to me. When things that that should kind of get a little bit of a buzz and, and and attention all of a sudden disappear off the radar that always makes me wonder more about them not less well thoroughbred <clears throat> thoroughbred racing it's amazing that it lasted this long with everything that was go that's been going on but it's they have unbelievable amount of lobbyists uh f f shooting for the, you know uh, on their side and they just let things go and go. It's starting to catch up to them now a, a little bit, but it's, uh, I mean, they, they write crazy rules and let certain things go just so they could bring their wives up to Saratoga with their big hats and everything. You know, they, they and, and a lot of thoroughbred, a lot of uh, uh, state people, uh, government people, uh, politicians are, are in the horse racing game. And, uh, and they just love it. It's the American thing you know uh it's just now it's just it's just so corrupt and run by total incompetent people um it's, it's you got any opinion on the new uh new governing body heisa the horse racing uh i have no i have no, I have no opinion i don't i don't i don't follow it because <clears throat> if i'm not in it i have no shot of getting ever getting back in it uh, I have. Are you barred now? Are you officially barred from racing? Uh, well, in nineteen in nine, when the hell was it? Uh, nineteen eighty. You you said your father in the eighties was a teller at Belmont. Yes, Aquitan. absolutely. His his boss, the head of mutuals, and the head of mutuals, and the head of mutuals and security at Belmont Yonker, a uh, Belmont. Aqueduct in Saratoga was the guy called Vinnie Hogan. Vince Hogan. I, I knew Vince Hogan personally. Okay. Through my Vin, dad. Vinnie Hogan was my next door neighbor growing up. Okay. He was a retired police captain, if memory yes. serves. Okay. Let me tell you the story. I'm so happy that you know him. 
<clears throat> when I got barred in 84. <clears throat> and Vince, as I knew Vince, Vince was a good guy. Vince was a great guy. Okay, Just good. All right. All right. Yeah. I got a story about him too. So you tell yours first. Okay. So. I was barred in 1984 for life. Because for failing to cooperate during an investigation. They had a bad race in Monticello, and they called me in as a witness against, I didn't want to go, but anyway, I refused to give up the guys. They had a fixed race, I knew about it, and I refused to give them up, and I lost everything. I lost millions fighting it, and I wind up, after three years fighting in three different states to get my license back, I was refused and barred, and I lost, I, at that time, I had a training center. I had over 100 horses in training. Uh, I, I had millions of dollars in the bank. I was doing really well. I gave it all up. And after my, after fighting, after the third, after all my appeals were gone and all my homes were gone, my training center, everything, and millions of dollars, uh, I was barred. I go to California. I'm in California. My sister calls me up. And she says, uh, I, I was born and raised in Jackson Heights, Queens, 91st Street between 30th and 31st Avenue. Uh, she says, and, and every house on the block had a kid. The kid, my next door neighbor was Vinnie Hogan. Same okay. age. He's a year older than me. And uh, I says, I'm not going to the party. I'm in California. She goes to the party. <clears throat> she talks to Vinny. Vinny says, whatever happened to Larry? Because I left home young. Vinny went on to be a policeman, on to be detectives, on to be chief of detectives and everything else. And uh, then, uh, uh, so my sister says, uh, uh, Vinny wants you to call him up. So I call him up and um, uh, he's, at, he's at Belmont Park. And uh, he says, get down here right away. So I fly in from California. I go see him. I says, how the fuck did you wind up here? He says, I wind up being chief of detectives. He says, and uh, when I was re retiring, <clears throat> they uh, wanted to give me the job as the racing commissioner. And I didn't want to take it because he lived in Long Island. Right. So um, he says, uh, but I, gave, I told him, uh, give it to my second in command. The guy who was underneath him as a detective, whatever you call him. <clears throat> he says, he's retiring too. <clears throat> he's a good guy. He's my friend. So they give him the racing commission job. And Vinny, they gave Vinny the job as head of security, head of mutuals at Saratoga, Belmont, and Aqueduct Racetrack. So now he says, so that's what I find out when I go in to meet him. So he says, uh, do you want your license back? I says, yeah, I want my license back. I says, but listen, if you're able to get my license back, which I doubt, I want it for thoroughbreds and train and standardbreds. I want a trainer driver for standardbreds, and I want to train this for thoroughbreds. He picks up the phone. He calls the head of the racing commission, who was his under, you know. Right. He says, so listen, he says, if a guy hasn't been licensed in eight years uh does he need a renewal or a new application a renewal application or a re uh, or a new one so he says well who's it for and he says larry roller and the guy says vinnie larry roller he's crazy he's on a terrorist list he said you can't get involved <laughs> with him but i already told vinnie that uh when you're barred for life which i was in 84 you're, you're allowed to reapply every year and they deny you because they just right. say, Are you willing to cooperate now? No, denied. Okay. Right. So uh, the last time I reapplied, uh, they had, by their own laws, they have 30 days to give you a decision. After, after three, four months, they still no decision. Now I'm starting to get mad because I'm broke. I'm penniless and I'm waiting and I'm just, I'm just mad at the world. So I call up and I and I says, listen, I says, you don't give me an answer. And I knew the answer, but I just wanted the answer. And they just right. jerk him around. Well, the, the investigator, when he retired, he gave it to somebody else. And then he's on vacation. And uh, so I says, you don't give me an answer by tomorrow. I swear, I'll blow that fucking building up. Within two or three hours, there were three FBI agents at my door. I didn't know that the Racing Commission had an office in the federal building on Bloom Street. It was a federal building. Right. So they put me on the terrorist list. That's how I got on a terrorist list for five years. 
no matter who threatened to blow up anything, they come to my house. It is one of the okay. So anyway, <clears throat> so Vinny says, "Look, just send the fucking application." And he he sent the application. So I told Vinny, I says, "You know, Vinny, the rules are when you get reinstated, you have to have a hearing." He says, "Fuck the hearing." <clears throat> so he calls up the guy. He says, "Just send a license. No hearing. No nothing." And that was good because I got my licenses and everything up. But when I applied in New Jersey, Zanzuki, who's the head of commission there, says, I want to hear, I want a copy of the report of the hearing. And there was no hearing. So right. I ended up paying like 60, 80,000 in an envelope, in a, in a brown paper bag. And I don't know where it went, but I wind up getting my license in New Jersey without a hearing. So any, anyway, uh, so that's, that's my story about Vin, Vinny Hogan. He uh, I, I, he died, great, great he guy, great he guy. Died a year, about a year ago, he died. I know, I know. I, I, I had heard that, and he wound up taking the heat for that whole mutual clerk scandal, yeah. which I can tell you what really happened there, which is not a very good look for Naira. But that's a whole nother story. But I, I, let, I know what let, happened. Okay, I know, you know, I know the let, whole story. Let me tell you what a good guy Vince was. Okay. <laughs> Um, my dad was a mutual clerk for years. Vince was his boss for a lot of those years. I was a mutual clerk for a couple of years, but I was more interested in gambling. You know, they used to go sign up. You used to have to like shape up to get, get work. I used to deliberately shape up last, late, sign in late. So I would go to the end of the list. So I didn't work so I could go gamble. So that shows where, where my head was at. Okay. Everybody wanted to make the union, got there early to sign in. I used to wait, everybody sign in, sign in last. So I knew they would never get to me. So I go to Saratoga one year, and before I go up, this is when the phone betting first came out, okay? Um, I was bringing 50000 up there to bet with, okay? So I called up the girl, Susan, that ran the betting account for Naira, and I said, listen, Susan, she knew me because I was a big better on the app. Mm -hmm. I said, Susan, I'm coming up. I want to bring a check for 50000 to put in my account when I get up there to bet for the meet. I'm coming up for the whole meet. She goes, no problem. Just come and see me and I'll put it right in for you. It won't be no problem. I'm like, okay. So I get up there. It's the second day of the meet. I, meet the, I miss the first day. I get up there. I go to Susan. She goes, they won't let me deposit this check for you. Um, they're going to put a hold on it for 10 days. I'm like, well, you can't do that for 10 days. Will, will they cash it for me? No, they won't cash it. It's too big, blah, 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 blah. You got to go see Jim Remy and Tony Prisco. Now, I don't like to mention names, but I don't like those guys. So I'm going to mention their names. And I did. Um, they worked under Vince. Okay. They were two of the like mutual supervisors. Okay. So I go up to the office and they're in the office. Vince's office is in the back. And I said, listen, guys. Um, I've got this check. I want to use it to bet through my Naira account. Um, Susan, I called up before I got up here. She wouldn't, she wouldn't, she, she says, you guys said, no, they can't, they can't deposit it. It's going to take 10 days to clear. That's half, that's a week and a half into the meet. You leave me, I can't make a bet. I'm looking to bet this race. I mean, that makes no sense to me. And now I can't cash it because you're saying it's too big. You won't even cash it. I don't understand. Well, you know, it's a big check. It's got a clear, you know, could take up to 14 days, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that's ridiculous. And she should have told me that in advance. I would have brought cash up here or something. I got a check. Where am I going to go cash up in Saratoga? So Vince must hear the argument from his office, right? And Vince didn't like no waves or no nothing. You know how it was. He was a no-nonsense guy. Didn't like waves. So he comes walking out and he goes, what's going on out here? So like, well, this guy wants to cash a check and he just walks over and he gives them like a look of disdain, okay? So I knew it was going to turn out okay. So he takes the check and he looks at it. He goes, you're John Stetton. I said, yes. He goes, you used to work here, correct? I said, yes. He goes, your father worked here many years, right? I said, yes. He goes, he used to, um, he retired a couple of years ago, right? I said, yeah. He goes, that's him, Joe. He goes, I know him. He goes, look at him. He goes, would you sign the kid? He signed the check. He goes, go tell Susan I said to deposit the check and bet. And he looked at me, he goes, you guys are just ridiculous. And I walked out. So that was my my once my one Vince Hogan story. And of course the check was good. Um, good guy. When Vinny um, was young, he had a he bought the first he bought a 1957 Chevy 
V8. He used to drag race that too. Uh, it was a black one. It was uh, it was uh, it was the first year they come out with uh, a V8. No, it was the second year. Fifty five was the first year to come out with a V8 engine, and then uh, uh, it was three three hundred and fifty horsepower, and I think they upped it in fifty seven. But he had a beautiful fifty seven Chevy uh bl uh, all all black and that's that's basically when i left the the area classy guy never yeah. never should have went away for that sh that that thing that was that was ridiculous what they did to him um larry we got to run i we we, we got to do another show we got to do another show we could do it on your channel mine there's so much you and i could get into and so much fun we could have I, I could talk to you all day long. If I didn't have to run, I would I would keep going. But I got I I I, I got to I could talk to you all day long. Well, we got a, we got a lot to talk about, and and ninety nine percent of my stories we didn't even hit, hit on yet. I know that I got so a hundred thousand questions for you. That's why we got to do again. This 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 was just kind of like a little introduction, um, into some of the stories that you're going to tell us. I'm, I'm I'm so glad. You know, it's so hard. It's so hard to, uh, and I try to do it on my podcast with pictures. Uh, but when 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 it's so easy for somebody to say that guy's full of shit. I don't believe that. But it's no. so nice when, like everybody says, how the fuck did you lost all your appeals? You lost everything. How did you ever get your license? Not only did you get your license back, but you got your thoroughbred license, standard bread license. There. Is because of Vinnie Hogan. And right. Who the fuck knows Vinnie Hogan? You. I know. I know Vinnie. I Hogan. never knew that. I know you're telling the truth because I know the kind of guy he was. Look what he did with me with the check. That yeah. check could have been no good. He knew my name. He knew my dad's name. He knew I was not a. You so know, I, I, dad I, was I, a straight shooter. You know what I mean? Had a very good reputation. You know what I mean? And, and he knew that. You know I, what I mean? I I grew up with Vinnie and right. his two sisters. His two sisters were Patty and Judy. He had two sisters, Patty and Judy. And uh, uh, Patty wind up marrying uh, one of the kids on a block, Anthony Scabarisi, and Judy, I, I, I forgot. But he was, Vinny's a great guy. I heard he died last year. But I have a picture of him because about 10, maybe 15 years ago, I had a big party and I invited all my cousins. It was about 350 people there. And just to have, just a, like a get together. Right. And I had Vinny come with all the kids on the block, and I took a, a picture. So I had that group picture with me and Vinny Hogan, and uh, I got I got to find it. I got to show it to you. The uh, look that he gave those two guys for breaking my chops about that check, the look of disdain that he was priceless. I wish I could have took a picture of it. It was just such such a look of like you guys, petty. I mean, it was perfect. It was a, just the perfect look. He didn't have to say a word. He just gave a look to them, like it was. It was. It was. It was, it was perfecto. I love. Is, is there any way? I I don't know because there's so much I want to ask that your friend Tommy. Uh, I spoke to him on the phone for Tommy Masses, the Hammer. Yes, yes, that's how he's the one put me kind of in touch with you. So. Yeah, well, what do you want? Why can't we do something where instead of having two boxes here, there's three? We can. We could get Tommy on. Tommy will do why it. Don't we, why don't we? Why don't we do that? Because I don't know how to do what you do. I don't. I'll set it do. up. Don't worry about it. I'll set, set it up, up where it's me, you, and 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 him. And that would be perfect because I don't know how to send the link. I don't know how to do that. I will do it. I will be in touch with both of you. I will do it. We'll do a show with me, you, and Hammer. Forget about the story between the three hammer? of us. That's his name. They call him Hammer because he bets like a hammer. Okay. They call that's it's his He's a he's a, listen. He's an aggressive better. He bets like I used to bet. All right. I don't bet that way no more. Um, I don't have the faith in the game that I used to. But 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 Hammer is an aggressive better, and that's why they call him Hammer. They call him that for a long time. A lot of other people they call hammer. This guy's hammer. That hammer is the real hammer. Yeah. Okay. Well, you set you set that up. That, that I'll set it up, man. We'll have a lot, a lot, a lot of fun, Larry. Thank you so much. God bless you. It was a pleasure getting getting face to face with you, um, even over the over the Zoom. And I'll definitely be in touch and set it up. Okay.
All right. Ciao. Have a great day. See you. You too. All right. Frankie Vittori. Ciao, Frankie. Tutta a posto. Tutta a posto. Yes, that's well, a good start. <laughs> so you have, you, you have lost your Italian. Frankie Dettori, legend, world-class jockey, one of the best ever to sit in the saddle, ambassador to the sport of kings. Meet Frankie during his fanfare like never before, only on Pass the Wire TV. Nobody does it better.